All right, um, so now we are going to have Brian um, speak a little bit about his work and its relevance to the city and hopefully your lives and your community. So take it away, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Thanks, Tiffany, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I, I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everyone and just the fact that you all have taken time out of your your evening to, to join us and learn a little bit about what, what we're doing in San Francisco and you have an opportunity to hear about uh, the hazards and resilience planning work that I do. And it was interesting, next slide please, Aaron. It's interesting because um, the poll questions, you know, I love those and I at one point we did ask a poll of people if they were familiar with the capital plan or not. This was about 10 years ago and I think 5% of the, of the respondents, this was actually to the I think it was a it was a commissioned public research opinion poll, and I think five percent said that they that they were familiar with it. But we quickly learned that that most of those were not that familiar with the capital plan. We think they just put it in there to make themselves sound really smart, or or maybe just because they thought they should be informed of it. Um, but our capital plan is something we've been doing for ten year for fifteen years or so, um, and it is it, it's not as well known as we would like it to be. But it's a process that we've really established and how we're gonna finance our infrastructure improvements. About five years ago, we added resilience to our capital planning program. And that's how we, we came up with the title Office of Resilience and Capital Planning. This is an office that's really devoted to taking care of the assets um, and ensuring that San Francisco uh, is resilient to acute shocks as well as chronic stresses. And, and I just wanna emphasize that when people think about resilience, often they think about it as a personal trait uh, but now we're talking about having resilient systems, and, and I think this belief that a lot of our natural systems are, are more resilient than some of the artificial ones that we've created. So we're trying to take advantage of those types of things. Um, and we're, we're trying to be aware that, um, that you can prepare for big earthquakes, um, but if you're not addressing stresses in communities, then you're never going to recover. Uh, from those earthquakes to the same extent that you would had you addressed the stresses. So if we're not thinking about housing, if we're not thinking about how people get to work or transportation, if we're not thinking about equity, um, then when we have a large earthquake or, or, uh, or COVID, I was gonna see a pandemic or any of those things, then those communities are much worse off. And, and we've seen this happen over and over again, um, that we need to be cognizant of, of these stresses, not just the big shocks. So that's a big part of what my office does and what I think about. Um, we're responsible for the city's 10-year capital plan. Uh, we do a hazards and climate resilience plan, which is the city's official hazard mitigation plan, which I will go into detail. And then we also do a lot of work around seismic safety. Um, we, we're thinking, you know, San Francisco is earthquake country. So there's been a lot of work um, to ensure that we're up, updating our building codes and that we're helping uh, ensure that, that we're seismically safe. So next slide. Thanks. So just some of the challenges to talk about in San Francisco, and I think probably most of the people on this call are familiar with these. You know, we're at a population now of getting close to a million people, 800, well, 884,000. It's the second densest city in the US to Manhattan. Um, so we're compact. Uh, we are largely, you know, we have some income disparities that we're struggling with, um, you know, White non-Hispanic median income is about 120,000, but black households, especially in the Bayview and other parts of the city are at 30,000. Um, so this is a, one of the stresses that I'm talking about. Um, you know, we have 11% of our population has pre-existing health conditions. 27% of our population is over, um, is gonna be over age 60 by 2030. Uh, and we expect that number to continue to grow. Um, and, and of course, we're still a very diverse city. So next, next slide. So in that growth, and, and I, when I say a challenge, I, I don't want to suggest that our diversity of those things aren't, uh, I mean, those are really what make us, uh, I think, more resilient. It's, it's our work to preserve that, that diversity. And when you think about our city, and this is a, a map here, the areas in the yellow represent areas of new growth, redevelopment, um, where, where we're adding housing primarily. It's, it, it's, we're moving toward more density. These were the old industrial areas. Um, and then when we think about overlaying some of the 
challenges, some of the resilience challenges of those areas, if you can go to the next slide, you, you sort of see that the same areas where we're growing, get, get the next slide, please, that's good. The same areas that we're growing are where we see liquefaction happening. So liquefaction is, is what causes, uh, it amplifies shaking in an earthquake. And when we have shaking in earthquakes, those are the areas that tend to see the most damage. And those also, you know, are probably not coincidentally in some of the areas where we have our vulnerable populations. Um, those were areas that were typically set aside for, for businesses, uh, for industrial uses and those types of things. Next slide. And now if we overlay sort of climate change impacts, um, and this is climate change, social, it, we're thinking about climate change and we're, we're looking at social vulnerability indicators separated out by census block. This is something that Department of Public Health put together uh, with the planning department and it, and it lays out a number of different, um, it looks at a lot, number of different vulnerability indicators, age, linguistic isolation, education, poverty, health status. And again, you can see the darker colors of the more vulnerable areas and it, it, it coincides with the liquefaction zones. It coincides with where we're seeing a lot of our growth. Uh, and it actually coincides with sea level rise, which I won't mention here, but a lot of the sea level rise is also impacting these areas. So this is a concern to us in making sure that we're developing plans that address, you know, that, that ensure that we're able to preserve these communities um, is important. If we go to the next slide. Um, when we think about climate change, and now I'm sort of zooming in as we think about overall resilience into climate change, we're, we're looking at these, uh, these different areas which are being intensified because of, um, because of what we're seeing happening in our climate. So extreme heat this past year, you know, we had 30 days, 30 spare the air days that far and away uh, was the record for spare the air days. We, we also saw, you know, um, extreme heat in 2017, we had six deaths from extreme heat um, so we know that this is this is something that's continuing to, to happen. Uh, drought, we're, we're expecting that we're in the middle of a drought. We're seeing increased temperatures related to drought, changing precipitation patterns. Uh, we're seeing more extreme precipitation. These, um, the, the large <clears throat> atmospheric rivers that are coming off the Pacific. Uh, wildfires, and again, even though wildfires may not be directly happening in San Francisco, we're seeing the impacts on air quality which is just below um, coastal flooding, stormwater, uh, soil liquefaction and earthquakes. Those are all you know, related to rising sea levels. So increasing temperatures, rising sea levels, changing precipitation are all driving um, challenges for us in terms of resilience. We can go to the next slide. So we've developed what our office focuses on you know, in this area is really these guiding plans. So. Uh, the first was Resilient SF, and Tiffany mentioned the, in the presentation or in the introduction. Uh, this is a document that highlights where we want to go, the definition of resilience, uh, and it had a number of strategies. Uh, that was done in 2016. We received support from the Rockefeller Foundation as one of the 100 resilient cities across the world that developed the strategy. Um, in even before that, if you look at the, the plan on the far right is our community action plan for seismic safety. This is a 30 year plan where we're addressing earthquake um, safety issues. So that was the soft story retrofit program. Uh, that was a program to look at private schools, earthquake retrofits for private schools, which don't fall under the same regulations as public schools. It also, we had a recent tall building study uh, and now we're looking at concrete buildings that are vulnerable. So that's a, a long-term plan uh, that was developed through a lot of community meetings that we're following through on. And then the one in the center is the Hazards and Climate Resilience Plan. This is required by FEMA. It's your local hazard mitigation plan. It has over 95 strategies um, related to it. And it's an annual, it, we have to provide updates annually to FEMA, but it, it's done on a five-year cycle. We can go to the next slide. Digging into the Climate Hazards Resilience Plan, um, I mentioned that it's required by FEMA. The other new feature, and this really came from the state, is that for the first time, local hazard mitigation plans in California have to address climate change. 
Um, in our previous plans, we may have mentioned climate change, but there wasn't any significant look at the risks associated with them. So with it. So we're, I think we're one of the first five cities or so in California, if not the, the first two, I think, to develop this. Uh, we put together a really comprehensive story map that I would encourage people to look at. Alex Morrison, who's helping facilitate one of the work group sessions today, uh, helped develop that. And you can begin to look at these different hazards and how they will affect your neighborhood. And you can overlap hazards. So you can look at liquefaction and earthquake in relation to flooding or in relation to heat or in relation to vulnerable communities. Um, federal and state requirements I mentioned. Um, we can go to the next slide here. And then I just want to lay it out uh, what we did. So in our hazards and climate plan, there are 13 natural hazards that are represented here by these symbols. And they're broken into four different categories, geologic, weather-related, fire-related, and then biologic and, and toxic. So our hazardous materials and pandemics. Um, but again, under geological, you can, you can see we have earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, um, you know, weather related, it's, it's going to be flooding, uh, high wind, extreme heat, and, and then fire, of course, there is always the risk of a large fire, a large urban fire, especially after an earthquake, like what we saw both in after the Loma Prieta earthquake and after the 1906 earthquake, uh, we saw that. And we also have poor air quality there. So if we go to the next slide. This lays out some of the different strategies. So I, I mentioned that there are 90, there, I think there are technically 98 strategies now that we are moving toward to become a more resilient city and to have more resilient communities. We've broken those strategies uh, into these four, um, four buckets that are on the left uh, around community resilience, building resilience, um, in, it, yeah, infrastructure resilience, that would be more for the, sort of the horizontal infrastructure like our transportation systems. Uh, and then we have these cross-cutting issues that really look at overall. And I, I would say kind of the climate action plan is also, is also similar and it's one of those overall, um, it, it, it captures you know, all of these categories. Uh, the, the ones on the right, the buckets on the right really show the different planning issues that we came up with that, that, we're, that we're looking to address. So we have strategies that are looking at housing vulnerable populations, you know, building internal capacity under buildings, it's primarily our municipal buildings, um, but they're also private buildings separate, separate from housing. Uh, and then infrastructure, clearly it's our lifeline systems, which are kind of communications and, and power, wastewater and transportation. Those are all critical infrastructure that's needed after any event, um, but, but in the long run, just for, for people to be able to live healthily. Uh, and then we have the cross-cutting issues. Next slide. So we're, you know, in San Francisco, we have a lot of different agencies. We're a city and a county, which also makes us unique and, and makes things a little bit more complicated, but also has the benefit of giving us a little bit more control and ability to do things. So we, we recognized a few years ago that I think we had 20 or so different departments working on climate and hazards uh, around the city. And we thought that we, we, we made the decision then that we needed to have a more uh, comprehensive and a more coordinated approach. So we put together this interagency climate resilience program. Uh, we hired a climate resilience coordinator and that person's job is just to coordinate all these different efforts. You can see in the center, the real focus, you know, at least here today is our, our hazards and climate resilience plan, which I went over. Um, then we have the climate action strategy, which is turning into the climate adaptation plan that we're, that we're all talking about. Um, and then we have our general plan updates, which are coming. And I think there will be some more slides later on uh, to talk about these, but we're updating our general plan um, uh, safety element, the housing element and the transportation element. And while the hazard and climate resilience plan is a five-year plan and the climate adaptation plan is probably in the five-year range, maybe a little bit longer, general plan updates tend to be 10, 15 to 20 years. So aside from the housing element, they take more time and they look more broadly. So being able to coordinate these three plans is really important. And then this show, and then I also just want to mention some of the other plans that are on the outside here that we're working on. You know, waterfront resilience, a lot of that's around the seawall effort, but it's also around flooding. Um, and the, the port's been doing a lot of work around those, that program. And then we have um, Islas Creek adaptation strategy, which is happening down in the Islas Creek area where, where we know where there's going to be significant flooding and sea level rise issues. 
Uh, Ocean Beach, we're already having issues with erosion. Um, and then in the top left, it's mentioned that we did a sea level rise vulnerability and consequences assessment, primarily led by the planning department that looked at, um, that, that looked at the different impacts and actually looked at it by neighborhood as well. Finally, I, don't, I do wanna mention that we're also working on an environmental justice element um, that was also related to state legislation that required us to do a, to, to do a hazards and climate resilience plan. Um, it also triggered, it triggered both uh, updates to the public safety element and updates to, uh, to an environmental justice framework. Next slide. I think that's it. I know that was a lot of information. I wanted to see if I could save some time for questions, but I'm not sure I was successful. <laughs> uh, but please let me know. And I'll, I think I'll pass it back to you, Tiffany. Thank you, Brian. Um, you're right. We actually don't have time for any questions, but I will highlight um, for everyone just a couple of points that I think are especially salient uh, from your presentation and connect that to the reason why we're all here today. So I want to remind everyone that your comment, Brian, around if you don't address stresses in the community, any large catastrophic event, be it earthquake, pandemic, what have you, will greatly exacerbate those stresses already present community. And that is exactly why San Francisco's Climate Action Plan will address more than climate change. The intention is to be able to address structural racism, income inequality, COVID from a health standpoint, and obviously the environmental consequences of climate change will be uh, of the utmost importance. And the issues that we discussed here do amplify each other and we have to address all of them um, together to be successful. Um, I think one very important component of making sure that's successful is harnessing the power of our community. Uh, so thank you everyone who has provided your input on this plan so far. And we will still need more engagement to make sure that this initiative is grounded in the aspirations and desires of the community and the plan for everybody.